Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Gut Brain Connection, Your Path to Cognitive Health. My name is Dr. Rachel Huesner, and I will be hosting this today on this very special topic that is near and dear to me. So thank you all for joining and thank you for introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, let's get started. Before we go in, I do wanna just reiterate what you see on your screen here, that there will be a link to the replay afterwards today. So everyone will be getting a link for today and then with the recorded video, and then you can put any questions that you have in the Q&A section. We'll get to those at the end. Okay, I'm just having an issue here. There we go. Okay, so hello everyone. I am Dr. Rachel Huesner. I am a naturopathic doctor and a part of the team here at Solsere. Um, I am RECODE certified. So that means that I have been trained by Dr. Dale Bredesen to reverse Alzheimer's and support the brain through his well-researched protocol. However, prior to this training, I focused heavily on um, gut health in my practice. So I actually came into this side of medicine after struggling a lot with my own health and with my own gut health. And I had to work pretty hard on that to finally feel better mentally and physically. Um, I come from a big Italian family and I had no idea that all of the gluten that I was eating was having such a profound impact on my health. And it wasn't until I had tested for it, um, removed it, that I noticed a huge difference within my gut itself, but that I also wasn't I wasn't needing a nap after lunch every day. And uh, I noticed that my psoriasis had improved and actually ended up completely resolving. Um, I noticed even a huge imp improvement in my overall mood. So this topic on the gut brain connection, it's very near and dear to me. Um, I think it's a very important topic for everyone and makes sense because we call commonly the gut our second brain, and we'll talk about why that is. But um, before we, we dive into what exactly the gut-brain connection is, I'd like to hear from the group if you've ever noticed a connection between you know how your stomach feels and how your mood or your mental clarity is that day, or how do you think your gut might be influencing your brain? You can put it in the chat. That's so nice to see everyone. Hello. Does anyone want to give their experience or how they have noticed that their stomach and their brain has been connected? Mass cell connection, definitely. Yeah, there, we'll, we'll get into how um, the immune system is regulated within the gut and that connection there. Brain fog, yes. I think we can all say that we have dealt with brain fog, unfortunately, um, and that can be many causes there, but our, our brain and our gut are connected. Sugar causes cognition to drop. Yes, we have so many patients who, by just getting into ketosis, you know, eliminating the sugar and focusing on healthy fats and healthy proteins, their cognition improves. So there's definitely a huge link there and I'm so happy that everyone was able to share their experience. Whitney says she had terrible H. pylori, had to take antibiotics and had terrible brain fog through that. So yes, there's, there's a lot of connection there. Um, so let's go on. I wanna talk a little bit about Julie first. Julie is one of my patients. She was 29 um, when she came in to see me. She was in, um, in marketing, I believe, for this big agency, um, but she was struggling with her mood. She would actually have to take time off of work because she was going in and out of these depressive and anxious episodes, and she was having uh, an extremely hard time focusing at work. She was even considering at this time 
going to a psychiatrist and getting evaluated for ADHD, possibly going on medication. Um, but she wanted to look into some other options first. So she came over to me and she came in thinking, my hormones are off. I need to focus on hormones. Um, and yes, that, that was things that we had worked on, you know, getting her cycle regular. Um, but what we really primarily focused on was her gut health. She was having constant loose stools and bloating. She ate a standard American diet, high in carbohydrates. Um, she was not having consistent bowel movements every day. So after working on her gut, we lowered some inflammation in there with some supplements like probiotics. We changed up how she fed herself. She was eating out a lot. And so we got her cooking more, eating more of a whole food diet. And she became a new woman. She felt like a new woman. She eventually was able to come off of her antidepressants. She never went on ADHD medication and actually ended up quitting her job because she got an even better job offer from another agency that recognized her incredible work. So she was really thriving is what I really would like to drive home here. And that she, for her, you know, mood was a big thing, but she was struggling also with focus and we were able to not have her get on any medication for that. And then there's Nathan. And I want to tell you the story about Nathan really quick. He was 62 when I met him, um, an engineer for aircrafts. He came to me because he started to recognize that he was forgetting things more. Um, he would forget where he put his keys or his to-do list for the day. And he even had his wife come in who pointed out um, that he would forget some of the neighbor's names. These are people that he had interacted with multiple times. He knew them, he knew their names and he started to forget their names. Um, so obviously this worried him. He had watched his mother battle dementia. So he came in for testing. And um, of course with his line of work, he was exposed to many toxins working on aircrafts and just working around different chemicals. So we treated him for that. We treated him for the incredible amount of stress that he was under with um, with his this line of work that he was in and his blood pressure definitely reflected that stress. But we, we worked on those things a bit. Um, but the most notable improvement in how he felt all around, but particularly with his cognition came from treating his gut. He had an overgrowth of pathogens in his gut. He um, was an avid traveler. So he traveled quite a bit overseas. He, we did some stool testing and he had a few parasites pop up um, as well as some candida, which is a yeast. So we got him on some anti-parasites, some antifungals, uh, treated both of those effectively, made sure they were gone. And he went from going to the bathroom every few days to going to the bathroom every day. And feel, he was mind blown by how he could feel um, by just having a daily bowel movement and by not having those symptoms that he had just thought were normal for most of his life. Um, but what really impressed him was how he could remember names again and not have to keep so many notes and lists uh, for the day ahead. So he was doing that previously to prevent him from forgetting things, but now he, he noticed he didn't have to do that so much. So this all went hand in hand with the improvement of his gut and digestion and just feeling better overall, better energy. So when we, when we talk about gut, Obviously there is a big connection to the brain, but it's really to the whole body. Um, today we'll focus on the brain, but I hope that everyone can see how important just um, the digestive system is. But really quick, let's also talk about what exactly is the gut brain axis. I know that this is a term that has been used a lot lately and there's a lot more research going into it, which is very exciting. Um, but the, the gut, when I say the gut, I really mean everything from starting in the mouth to the anus. It's, it's essentially a tube that connects those two parts and it's how we digest our food and we absorb our nutrients, but it's the whole thing. It's not just the lower intestines um, 
and uh, the, the lower part of our digestive tract, it can be the esophagus, it can be the mouth, it can be the stomach, all of those organs in between. So what is the gut-brain axis? This is the complex communication network that links your gut and your brain. And there's some key players here. There is uh, the gut microbiota, so our gut microbiome. This is the trillions of bacteria and other microorganisms that live in the intestines that have some vital roles that include digesting food and producing vitamins. They also protect against other harmful pathogens like bacteria and viruses. And then there's these nervous system components. So we have the enteric nervous system, which is often called uh, the second brain. Uh, this is the network of neurons actually within the gut itself. And I don't need you to know this name and, and know the science behind it and all of that, but I need you to know that your gut has its own nervous system. Um, so it's, it has its own brain in a way. Um, it controls digestion by getting movement of food through the intestines, secreting digestive enzymes, getting blood flow to the gut and send signals to the brain. And we'll, we'll talk about how that happens. Um, but then there's the, the central nervous system, which is the, the brain and the spinal cord. So the, the brain part of all of this that controls the function of the body and the mind. So this part communicates with the nervous system within the gut via a very special connection called the vagus nerve. Um, so you have your brain, you have your enteric nervous system, and then you have the vagus nerve, which is this two-way telephone line that connects the two. Um, and so there's this bi-directional communication where you have the neural pathways going back and forth. You also have hormones like cortisol and serotonin that act as messengers going back and forth. Super important for regulating mood, stress, digestion. And then you have immune pathways. So I know someone mentioned mast cell activation and um, I couldn't tell you how many times I have patients come in that talk about their, how often they're getting sick and um, how that can affect their gut, but also their brain and brain fog. You have these immune cells and inflammatory signals that can travel between the gut and the brain. Um, and all of these affect mood and, and cognitive function. So there's this communication network between the gut and the brain, and it's, it's very important for our overall health, but it's so interesting, um, all that can really go back and forth. Um, how does this ultimately affect mood and behavior? Well, you may have seen this fact before, but the gut produces neurotransmitters um, like serotonin, actually 90 to 95% of our serotonin is made in the gut, which can influence mood, cognition, motivation. Yeah, 50% of dopamine is actually also made and produced in the gut. And then other transmitters as well. So GABA, which helps to calm us down. Um, acetylcholine, which is necessary for attention and memory, uh, arousal, motivation, and then norepinephrine. So essentially, what I'm trying to say here is that a healthy gut can mean a healthy, happier, sharper mind. So when we have disruptions here um, within the gut-brain communication, it can lead to issues like anxiety, depression, but also neurodegenerative diseases. So how, is this, how does this all go hand in hand with cognitive decline? Um, that's a big part of our practice here at Solsari. Um, when there's gut dysbiosis in general, which we know can be from um, poor diet, high in sugar, processed foods, overuse of antibiotics, which tend to kill off our good bacteria, you know, those, um, the, the fighters that will help to keep things in balance. Dysbiosis is essentially an imbalance of those gut bugs. So we need the good ones still. And antibiotics can kill those off. Um, chronic stress can also cause dysbiosis, lack of sleep. We just talked about that nervous system component there. Um, and then environmental toxins. It's really common that you can have toxins from say mold or mycotoxins and they can inhabit the gut that can then throw off the bacteria there. 
how does this contribute to conditions like dementia then? So you have inflammation, um, higher levels of inflammatory markers are found in patients with these neurodegenerative diseases, but dysbiosis can cause so much inflammation within the gut that can then spread to the brain. So, you know, whether that's the dysbiosis from the listed, the factors listed there, or from lack of exercise or from alcohol, all of those inflammatory causes can also go to the brain. And then this will then disrupt those communication between the brain cells, cause death of brain cells, and then affect those areas that are responsible for memory and learning. So we have inflammation. Um, toxins are huge as well. That can, can, um, can lead to conditions like dementia. Harmful bacteria itself can produce neurotoxins that enter the bloodstream and then go to the brain. Um, you can also have uh, impaired elimination. So if you're not having proper bowel movements every day, those toxins that are supposed to get out of you are gonna recirculate and cause more. They can cause neurodegeneration. It can be neurotoxic itself. Nutrient absorption. So any kind of imbalance can impair nutrient absorption and deprive the brain of essential nutrients neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine that we had talked about before. Um, and then chronic inflammation can even affect tau protein phosphorylation. So that can lead to these neurofibrillary tangles um, and amyloid plaque that we see in Alzheimer's. And then also loss of dopamine producing neurons that we see in, in conditions like Parkinson's. So there's a huge link here between just the inflammation, the toxins, the, the different um, causes of dysbiosis within the, within the gut, and then how that can cause neurodegenerative conditions. I want to go back real quick to the, the role of the vagus nerve. Um, this was that two-way connection that we had talked about between the gut and the brain. Um, it's our 10th cranial nerve. It goes from the brainstem to our bellies and it innervates our major organs, our heart, our lungs, our digestive tract. It regulates our heart rate, our digestion, our breathing, but it's very important that we can activate this nerve to allow for digestion to, um, to properly function. So in order to have our nervous system of our gut turn on, we need to have our rest and digest turn on, right? That, that part of the parasympathetic phase. Um, and that's through activating the vagus nerve. So higher vagal tone um, is actually associated with better emotional regulation and reduced stress and improved cardiovascular health. Whereas lower vagal tone is linked to uh, inflammation, anxiety, depression, chronic diseases, so if we can activate this vagus nerve more um, and more effectively, then we can turn on our, our digestion processes, but also have improved heart rates and respiratory rates. And how we can stimulate that is through what you see on your screen there. There's deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, um, cold exposure. I often tell patients, um, to build up resilience within the nervous system to turn on your vagus nerve. You can even just turn the shower to a few seconds of cold at the end after you take your normal shower. Um, if you can work up from a few seconds to 30 seconds up to a minute, that would be great. And just end it there. Um, for as cold as you can tolerate, the colder, the better, because we, we can't get too cold with our showers. Um, but that will actually help build resilience and turn this on which can then help throughout the rest of the day. And I love this for patients who have IBS or more gastrointestinal conditions related to anxiety, depression, more of that nervous system component, because it can help build, like I said, that resilience where then you feel mentally stronger throughout the day and then digestion can follow. Singing, chanting, humming, these are all ways to also activate. Um, meditation and mindfulness, switching into that parasympathetic state, exercise, specifically um, aerobic exercise, 
but even exercises that we can in incorporate meditation and mindfulness like yoga or tai chi really wonderful for stimulating and then massage actually is wonderful for this um, specifically of the neck and the shoulders because of how the vagus nerve passes through here um, I often remember when I was uh, a nanny for young children, I would I'd grab the neck at back of their neck and kind of massage the, the muscles around the neck here. And it would instantly calm them down. And it wasn't until I understood about the vagus nerve that I could see why that made sense. Cause then I was kind of getting them out of this sympathetic state and into the parasympathetic state. So if you have a partner, someone that can help um, massage the neck and the shoulders, you now have a reason why that can help um, with things like digestion. So I hope now everyone has a good understanding of why the gut and the brain are connected and why it's so important to have a healthy gut for a healthy brain. Um, but it's not always that patients come into my office and they understand that their gut isn't working optimally. Um, it's often they think, oh, everything's fine. I feel fine. You know, I'm not bloated. I, I go to the bathroom. Everything's great. So here are some questions to ask regarding your gut health and see how good is your gut really? My, the first one is always, well, how often are you having a bowel movement? Um, ideally in a perfect world, a gold star would be to have a bowel movement three times a day. Think of how a dog, um, they eat three meals. If you take them out after those meals, they'll have a bowel movement every time. That would be ideal, but at least one bowel movement a day is really what we're looking for. Um, if you are not having a daily bowel movement, you're not eliminating properly. And when we don't eliminate properly, we have the buildup of toxins, we have the inflammation that can go to the brain, et cetera. And things start to back up. Things can overgrow in those situations. So how often um, is it well-formed and easy to pass? There's times where you can be going multiple times a day, but is it going too quickly through the, the GI um, are you not absorbing your nutrients because it's going too quickly? There's this fun stool chart. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this before, but this um, is a great way for patients to visualize what is a healthy bowel movement and what is not a healthy bowel movement. So about types three and four, what we consider normal. Um, type one and two is a little bit more on that harder side, um, probably drier, not getting enough hydration, and then uh, types five, six, and seven, more of the loose stool, more diarrhea, like uh, not probably absorbing nutrients because it's going through too quickly. So is it well-formed and easy to pass? Is there anything in this stool that can be concerning or point to something going on there? Is there any undigested food? Um, if there's some undigested food there, you're probably not breaking down your food appropriately and then not absorbing the nutrients from that. Um, is there blood in the stool? Is there, uh, are there any hemorrhoids or polyps or other things that we might need to investigate further? Um, or mucus present in the stool. Sometimes you can see some mucus, which are essentially just white blood cells um, that can show that there's some kind of inflammatory response there. So all of these, great to assess for. Um, if you don't already look at your stool, you can find some good clues from that. And my patients always look at me crazy when I ask them these questions, but then you start to, you start to see how you feel great when your poops look great. So do you feel complete after using the bathroom? Um, that's another one too, where you may be having a bowel movement, but not feeling, not getting everything out, or you still have some left, where you have to go again later, um, but it's still that can be trending towards constipation. And we wanna make sure you feel complete, they're well-formed, you're having regular bowel movements. Higher up, you can have some heartburn or reflux if there are some things going on, some H. pylori, some um, hiatal hernia type things can cause um, reflux. Abdominal pain, bloating, excessive gas, nausea, vomiting can also indicate some other things going on there. Um, systemically, I want to know, do you have any skin conditions? Um, if there are immune system activation happening within the gut, then that can cause things like eczema, psoriasis, it can cause acne, 
Um, there can be fungal infections that go from the gut systemically. There can be allergies. You can start to react to more foods. When was the last time you used antibiotics? We know we had said that that one um, antibiotics or kill off those good defenders of the gut. So I'd want to know that. Um, if you've had chronic antibiotic use or widespread antibiotic use, that can affect the gut. So it's good for me to know these things. And then do you have a history of traveling abroad and getting sick? You know, are you at risk for things like a parasite that can linger around longer than you would expect? So some questions here to think about, right? Are you actually having an optimal um, digestion and digestive system? And then to kind of bring it all together, we, I will nail this in, a better gut can mean a better brain. And how can we do that with just things like diet and lifestyle interventions? You can eat balanced diet, rich in fiber, rich in prebiotics that are these non-digestible food components that actually, um, they help feed the good bacteria. So they help promote the growth of those beneficial bacteria. That can be found in things like garlic and onions, um, asparagus, bananas, chicory root, artichokes, apples, oats, um, probiotics, which are live bacteria, they're fermented foods, um, great for gut health in general, yogurts, kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi, other fermented foods, um, and then omegas. So those have anti-inflammatory properties for the gut. And that could be from fish, flax seeds, walnuts, avocados. So you really want to have a balanced diet that will be beneficial for the gut. You want to keep things moving. We talked about having, um, you know, your daily bowel movement. You can help that with getting regular physical activity that gets the blood pumping throughout your whole body, but also to the gut. It will, it will allow more blood flow to the gut, which is needed to get things moving. Hydration, having adequate hydration, you need enough water within the gut to move things along. And then if you're still struggling with some constipation, um, talk with your provider about adding things like magnesium citrate or magnesium oxide. Um, there's supplements that have aloe in it or even additional fiber supplements to bulk up the stool and help with transit. And then uh, foundationally, stress management and adequate sleep. So going back to that nervous system component within the gut, those can also be beneficial. There was a time um, before I was a doctor where I had to work very late. Um, I was an EMT and I would be uh, doing the overnight shift. And I would know every time that I stayed up very late, my gut never felt right the next day. It never felt right. I never was able to eat things that I normally could eat because my stomach was always really upset. Similar to, you may have noticed when you wake up really early some days, maybe to catch a, an early morning flight, you can't eat breakfast, you feel queasy, your stomach is upset. You need adequate sleep to have a healthy gut as well. So these are just some reminders for what we can do with our diet and lifestyle to help with our gut. But essentially, that doesn't always do it, right? We need to also treat the underlying cause if there's some other things going on there like pathogens, pathogens overgrowing, bacteria, yeast, um, parasites. We, I like to test uh, with comprehensive stool tests to see exactly what we're catching there. Um, leaky gut is another thing that we'd wanna treat. Leaky gut is this term for basically when we have um, spaces within the gut lining that shouldn't be there and things are then getting through into the bloodstream, things that normally do not get through. Um, so we can tighten that up, lower inflammation within the gut and seal that lining up. Toxins, um, we talked about the, the toxins produced by the bacteria that we'll want to kill off, but then also other environmental toxins that can affect the gut. Low stomach acid is a really big one as well. Um, especially in patients as they get older, it's natural that our stomach acid goes down. Um, so often we'll have to increase stomach acid with apple cider vinegar. You can take some apple cider vinegar before meals. I like to do 
about a tablespoon diluted in water, about eight, six to eight ounces of water, enough so that way it's not too harsh. Um, that helps to bring the acidity of the stomach up, which is actually very healthy because it will help uh, produce digestive enzymes to help break down the food. But then also because that's the first defense when we are exposed to a pathogen from food or from water, it hits our stomach and it's usually, it's supposed to be a, an acidic environment that will kill off those uh, pathogens. But it's really common that between age and stress, that stomach acid drops. So you could do some apple cider vinegar. I love digestive enzyme supplements that already have um, hydrochloric acid in it to help with stomach acid. Um, and then it could also be a structural cause that we want to look at. So if there is a lot of indigestion, a lot of heartburn, a lot of reflux or just kind of upset stomach in general, it could be things like a hiatal hernia, which is when the stomach actually goes above the esophagus. And that's a structural cause that we then have to address. Okay. So this is my favorite way to, to look under the hood and see what exactly is going on. And this is through um, a comprehensive stool test. I use GI map by Diagnostic Solutions. And I like this one because you're getting a comprehensive look. It's a bit different from the stool test that you would get from LabCorp or Quest or conventionally that just looks if you have some blood in the stool or maybe if you have some of these really bad pathogens like E. coli or C. diff. But it doesn't show you a good look into the microbiome. It doesn't show you the commensal or the beneficial bacteria. So this test does. This test shows you your bad bacteria, your good bacteria. It shows you viruses. It shows you yeasts. It shows you parasites. It can also show you inflammatory markers, um, if they're the digestive function, so your levels of digestive enzymes, if there's fat in the stool. So we can get a really comprehensive look at how your gut is functioning and the balance of the pathogens and bacteria within the gut. And then tonight, um, and actually through the end of the month, we are going to be offering a test plus consult with the GI map. So um, you will, if you, you'll get a link actually for the replay. And then also with, um, you'll get this little, this will show up on that webpage with the link that's a test plus console offer where you can register here. And it's a consult with me that's either done locally or virtually. And we'll go over the stool test and say, okay, you know, what is happening? You know, what are your symptoms? What is the stool test showing? And I can give you some recommendations based off what we talk about and what we see. So you would go to the link that Tyler will provide. Um, you will see actually with on that web page itself, there's an old webinar on there <laughs> until this webinar goes up on there. I think it's about hormones, so sorry about that. But um, all of that information for today will still be there. Um, and you'll click on the link, you can register, you'll get the stool, the stool test shipped right to you since it's an at-home test. And then once those results are in, we'll go over it and we will have a little mini consult. Um, so great way to, again, look at all of these different markers. I think this is one of seven pages that we look at on the test itself and then understand what can be happening within your gut and ultimately how that can affect your brain. Okay, folks, that is everything. Does, I would love to take some questions now and see, let's see what's in the Q&A. So first, what is adequate sleep? Great question. Um, when I talk about sleep with patients, I want to know what time they're getting to bed, what time they're waking up and how they feel in the morning. If they're feeling well rested, that can be a good indicator alone. If you're feeling rested upon waking that you have adequate sleep, ideally having around eight hours a night is best, but getting into also adequate amount of REM and deep sleep. And that is best determined if you're not tracking it, trying to 
Do biohacker tracking best determined by how you feel upon waking and if you need a nap later in the day. That is um, the number one thing I look for with patients. So trying to get to bed at a reasonable time. So that way you have enough time to fall asleep, stay asleep, and then wake up feeling well rested, hopefully getting around eight hours. Um, D says, hi, Dr. Rachel, what tests do you recommend to determine lower left pain, um, abdominal pain, having one and off for two months? Okay, so lower left pain in the abdomen. Um, definitely would want to look at the stool and see if anything is showing there. Sometimes lower left pain can be from the intestines causing uh, things like diverticulosis or diverticulitis when there's some pouching within the intestines. So we can run a stool test. We can at least see what's happening there with the um, overall balance of bacteria, like I said, pathogens and, and levels of inflammation. But sometimes we have to get a bigger look and we can order things like imaging. Um, so an abdominal ultrasound is sometimes necessary to see more closely what's happening there. Um, and yes, we do work with other doctors, so we can always, um, you know, collaborate on care there. Unfortunately, the stool tests are not available outside of the United States. Um, there are a few exceptions. So if you go into that link, you'll see what states we cannot ship to. Uh, I believe there's three or four of them. And let me just check the chat to make sure I'm not missing anything. So thank you, Tyler, for that link. Um, just a reminder, that link will take you to the landing page for today's webinar. It will have a uh, an old webinar there until this one is up, but all of the information for the GI map test and the consult will be there. Okay, and I'm going to keep looking at these Q&A, so keep sending them. I'm just going back and forth between the chat and the Q&A, making sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. Low red blood cells, low white blood cells, um, low sodium, low chloride. So with seeing that, um, there's definitely some type of an immune response. If you're having low white blood cells, we'd want to see if that's coming from the gut. We'd also want to see why are your electrolytes low? Um, that can sometimes be from, you know, if there's something like leaky gut happening. So all in all, uh, stool test is, it's wonderful for helping to look at the whole body. Um, sometimes we do need some more tests to know exactly what's going on there, some additional labs. I'd want to make sure you know, liver and kidneys and all other organs of elimination are healthy as well. And that would be through blood labs. Um, there's a question talking about different antibiotics to treat an illness. How long with a good diet exercise can it take to recover the good bacteria in your gut? So that's a great question. Um, it's kind of different for everyone, right? And the state of your gut um, prior to antibiotic use and while on different antibiotic use, we actually say at minimum that you should be on uh, probiotics after an antibiotic for about 90 days. So that's, I know, a quite, a, quite a long time, but most people need to be on a good probiotic no matter what, even if they are not on antibiotics. So give yourself a good 90 days after being on an antibiotic, probably a bit longer since you were on multiple um, another trick for antibiotics is, I'm sorry, for probiotics is you want to always introduce new ones to the gut. So we like to say every 60 days or so rotate through different high quality probiotics, especially after being on um, strong antibiotics. I like to have patients on ones that are more about a hundred billion CFUs. So that means that they're a pretty high dose. Um, we use Orthobiotic, Probiomax, these are different, um, I think Orthomolecular Zymogen, those are brands of ones that we use, but there's other ones out there on the market and I want you to cycle through them. When I talk to a patient, they may have had probiotics in the past that have worked really well for them and we'll still keep them in, but cycling through those higher doses of around hundred billion every 60 days or so. Okay.
see what else is here. So there are such thing as um, probiotic bacteria associated with specific plants. Um, so there are, it's more prebiotic. So probiotics come from fermented foods like yogurts and kimchi. Um, the prebiotics are what you can get from certain plants. And you, the, it's, I don't have one already made right now, but it's something that um, I'm sure there's a document out there on Google that can show you exactly what prebiotics you can get from things like garlic and bananas um, artichokes, and those are going to be like fertilizer for, um, fertilizer for the gut. Let's see. I'm not familiar with, um, the super gut yogurt. That sounds great. Um, he advocates very high levels of beneficial bacteria cultures in yogurt. I'm not associated with, or I'm not familiar with that one. Um, but I do think that there are certain yogurts that work well for some people and don't work well for others. Specifically, I've had some of my lactose intolerant or, or dairy sensitive patients try some of the high uh, culture coconut yogurts and some brands work really well for them and some brands do not. So when it comes to yogurt, um, definitely test it and see for yourself because it might be different for everyone. Okay, sorry, I'm just going between the chat and the Q&A, making sure I don't miss something. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I know some of you have to go, but definitely check out that link that Tyler posted. You will also have this sent to you via email with a replay from today. Okay, so I see a question here. My son has brain fog and depression. We suspect he may have MTHFR gene. He finds exercise and methylfolate both make him feel better usually. What do you recommend? Yeah, so the um, MTHFR, that can, there's, it can go back and forth um, depending on other genes that are associated with that. Um, but some patients are more sensitive to methyl B vitamins and some feel really good on them. So. If they feel great on the exercise and the methylfolate, that would be wonderful. Um, but I would want to look more into what a stool test would show for him, right? What is the level of bacteria? What are the levels of inflammation within the gut? Um, is he breaking down his foods appropriately? Is he absorbing his nutrients appropriately? So he might feel really good when he's supplementing with that B9 because he's not getting adequate amount of his B vitamins to begin with. So um, looking to see both at his stool test, but also a nutrient test there. Um, so we can look, assess based on what we see, if perhaps he's just not, he doesn't have the building blocks, right? To make some of those neurotransmitters. Um, we like the, the nutrient eval test. It's a, nu a micronutrient test, but it also shows us it shows us in gut markers and inflammation markers. And um, I like that one a lot because we can see breakdowns of all nutrients of all amino acids. And sometimes those amino acids are low that are needed to make things like serotonin and dopamine. And so we can get a more comprehensive picture there. Are probiotics helpful for SIBO? That's a great question, Whitney. Um, actually, not all the time, usually not. SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And that can be uh, when bacteria that's supposed to be in the large intestine goes into the small intestine. And um, the giving, your, giving more probiotics can actually cause more of that overgrowth within the small intestine. So a general rule of thumb is if you have SIBO, which we can test for usually via a breath test, um, we can also assess a bit on the stool test based on what bacteria is popping up. If you, if it's more SIBO like, um, if you have a general rule of thumb, if you have SIBO, if we think we have, if you have SIBO, we wouldn't want to give a bunch of probiotics, especially the higher dose ones. Uh, Gina asked, how does the mouth affect the digestion and brain? And I, yes, we always actually go over this in our consults. We 
there's a part where I'm always asking about your dental history, your, um, if there's a lot of infections in the mouth, root canals, cavities, how often you're going and getting cleanings, if you're brushing and flossing. So there's a couple different ways this affects the digestion in the brain. One way is that you actually start to produce digestive enzymes when from the saliva in your mouth. You actually start to break down food from that. So if there's something going on there um, where you have an infection, dysbiosis there, that can affect di the digestive process. Um, but also if there's uh, an infection or there's gingivitis, if there's a lot of bleeding with the gums, inflammation in the gums, that is a very close blood supply to the brain. So often, especially with my cognitive decline patients, we're assessing for infections within the mouth, um, hidden infections, right? Or even things like gingivitis. We wanting, wanting to make sure that those are eliminated. Usually we bring on the help of a biologic or holistic dentist to do that. Um, but even using some oral probiotics can help balance that microbiome there. Okay. Um, how do you get rid of parasites? So um, obviously with parasites, we can look at the stool test to see if it's actually coming out in the stool. And then depending on what ones we're seeing, we usually like to give different types of herbal or medications that are specific for anti-parasitic treatment. Parasites are tricky though. So um, usually what I see is that we have to rotate through different anti-parasitic medications. Um, and to try to get them in different phases of their life cycle. So that way we know that they're completely gone. And then I always retest to make sure that they are, they're no, no longer showing up on, um, the, on the stool test. Okay, I see a few more that came in. Chronic strep, Sonia, that's a great question as well. Um, this can, so strep is a normal bacteria that can be within the mouth, it can be within the gut. Um, but if it's at high levels for long periods of time, it's definitely showing dysbiosis of some sort. And uh, it's, it's a big, um, damper on the immune system. So depending on where it's, if you're having symptoms of it and what, how it's manifesting, you know, we'd want to maybe give you some probiotics to balance the microbiome, um, give you some immune support when we see an overgrowth of some of these pathogens, especially the ones that are um, normal bacteria that are just overgrown, we can give you some immune support, vitamin C, vitamin A, those things, but also certain herbal antimicrobials to help kill, bring those into a more normal level. And then the probiotics to help bring up the good bacteria. So it's kind of this balancing act that we have to do. Okay, let's see if I missed anything else. Best time to take probiotics. So um, I actually recommend taking a probiotic with a meal. So that way you can help digest um, the food and that it will also be adequately absorbed. Um, I don't always love gummies. Um, I do think that, you know, they can have more sugar than probiotic pills. Um, and so there are some powders out there. I've actually seen that the seed probiotic, which is just an over-the-counter probiotic, patients do really well on that one. So um, I wanna say that one has a powder form of it, but even just opening up the capsules and putting them into water can be really helpful. Um, sometimes I'll have patients swish it around in their mouth if there's something oral related before swallowing to help both the um, intestines and the, the mouth. Okay, yes, Lori, I see there's bloating and abdominal discomfort, um, borderline diarrhea, so loose stools, right, for months. Things are not being broken down appropriately. They're going too quickly through the gut. Eats and sleep well, but it's under a lot of stress. So yes, still would wanna run a stool test on you because typically what I see Stress has a big component. We talked about that, right? There's a big connection there. Um, but stress lowers the immune system of the gut itself. So often I will see an overgrowth of certain bacteria or viruses 
um, that can be associated with that loose stool. So we would definitely wanna run a stool test to see what's popping up there. How can you self-test if your gut is getting better? That's a great question, right? We don't always have to retest, although it can be um, a nice way to look at the data and not guess. But if you're having, if you're answering those questions that we looked at on that, that slide before, are you having daily bowel movements? Are you having well-formed bowel movements? Do you, um, are you noticing even systemically, maybe less allergies, maybe your sleep is better, but definitely within your elimination itself, that is a great way to test. Are you, are they a healthy brown color versus a more yellow or green? Is there, you know, no longer any digested food in the stool? These are all ways that you can self-test that your gut is getting better. Um, we talked about the gut in the mouth. Gas frequency and the gut, yes, and smell, yes. So typically the smell of um, gas has to do with the bacteria that's fermenting within the gut. Um, I see this and you, you may notice it yourself, especially with constipation, when things back up within the gut, um, you things start to ferment and that can cause an increase in gas and a worse of a smell of gas. Um, but yes, the gas frequency, so that's usually, the gas is usually produced from the bacteria itself. So if you're noticing more, it can be that there's more of those um, pathogenic or more inflammatory type bacteria that's overgrowing. Does mycotoxin live in the gut? So mycotoxins are toxins produced by mold, um, by mold spores that yes, they can live in the gut. They like wet dark areas. So I think of the sinuses, I think of the mucous membranes here and the mucous membranes of the gut. So you can have um, fungal colonization within the gut. And it's often where we have to detox patients from mold, but also get them on some antifungals to help kill that off and make sure, make sure, make sure you are having proper elimination. And I can say that over and over again, because if we're detoxing you, we detox a lot through the stool and we want to make sure that we are ridding it every day so that it's not recirculating. Um, there are certain swabs. So someone asked, Kathy asked, how do you test for mouth dysbiosis? There are certain swabs um, that will look at the microbiome um, of the mouth. I, but again, it's one of those things where you can usually tell based on just symptoms and their history of um, infections or uh, even infections of the head and the neck. You know, if you're having a lot of lymph nodes um, enlargement within the neck, that can be something going on in the mouth. Um, but it's not something that I typically test for unless we can't get to the bottom of it without uh, making sure that the teeth and the dental health are ha happy and healthy. Um, a, a way that you can actually look really closely there is through a cone beam scan. And that is done from a holistic, usually biologic dentists. And it's kind of the one that goes all around the head and it can look for hidden infections within the jaw, within the bones of the mouth, um, under the teeth, under the gums, which can be really, really sneaky and have a profound effect on the brain. So that's something that there's a, a marker that we look at in the blood um, that is can be related to that and it can show that there's some inflammation there. Um, so yes, I guess there actually, there are ways. So you can swab and look at the microbiome. We can run that blood marker that shows if there's some inflammation from the mouth. And then typically if I see that, I'm saying, go get a cone beam scan. Let's have a dentist look for any kind of hidden infections there. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's an old root canal or it's something that you had no idea was even causing issues. Okay, I'm going to take just a few more questions and then we'll wrap up for today. And just a reminder that you will be getting an email with the replay from today and with the test plus console offer. Tyler has been putting that in the chat so you can look at the link there. That's where you can register and get that stool test sent home to you and get a consult with me so we can go over it and we can get your gut feeling better and get your brain working better. 
All right. Um, so it's, I'll, I'll put up this slide one more time just to talk about the consultation since I see a question there. Um, what is included in the consultation? And so you will be getting the test sent home to you. Um, and that is to be collected at home. You then sent it back to the lab. They will process it, send it to send the results to me. And then we'll have a consult where we go over the results. You know, what am I seeing here? But also, what are you experiencing? I want to know what are your symptoms? What could that be in indicating? And then what is the data showing us? Are we seeing that you have an overgrowth of pathogens, that you have a ton of inflammation, maybe that you're reacting to gluten? That test can show a reaction to gluten within the gut. It can show if there's any blood in the stool, it can show if there's parasites, if there's candida or other funguses. Um, so this is a really great way for us to, to look at that, but for me to also ask some questions that we would normally ask during an initial intake to see, you know, how is your gut functioning and what is your diet like? And all of, what is your stress like? What is your sleep like? All of these things that can affect the gut and then coming up with uh, some recommendations for you specifically. Um, the blood marker, Kathy, is LP little a2. Um, and this is sometimes a marker you might see on a cardiovascular panel. Um, but for us, we see that it's highly associated with uh, our patients that have those um, hidden dental infections. So when it's high, we're always sending them to the dentist for that. Test, how long does testing take? Um, so the test itself is just you're collecting your stool, putting it into a little bit of a little vial and then shipping that off to the lab. Um, the results usually come back depending on how backed up the lab is, but usually around three to four weeks. So that's when we, we can then go through your results and do a consult. And it's not available in Canada. Unfortunately, we cannot ship outside of the United States. Okay, I'm going to take one more question and then um, we will wrap up for today and you will get this sent to you. So again, I'm so happy that I could um, be here with you all today and give you this information. This hits really close home to me. I love the gut and I love working with the gut and how it can affect brain and mood and cognition. So I'm so excited that we were able to host this today and that we can offer this consult. So this offer will be and just until the end of the month. So sign up. Um, you'll, you can use that link that Tyler is sending you and it will also be emailed to you. Okay. I hope I didn't miss anyone. If I did, um, let's see, I'm just looking one more time. Uh, I don't think so, but there's, it's also, it's very possible. I may have listened, missed someone. So please reach out to Solceri. Um, you can, Tyler, just put it in there and you can email hello at solceri.com with any questions. And I look forward to um, meeting you all and seeing what's going on with the gut. So everyone take care. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. It was a pleasure and I hope everyone has a beautiful evening.